join me in welcoming my friend, Michael Austin. Well, thank you very much to the Wichita Pachyderm Club for, for having me out here. And, well, actually, first and foremost, thank you to, to, to Joseph Elmore over there. He was the first one who gave me a call and said, hey, would you be interested in coming by and speak? And I'd say I'd love to. And then that's kind of how we got the, the ball rolling. So it's a pleasure to be with you here um, again today speaking about, obviously, the issues that we care about the most. Um, my name is Michael Austin, and, and as been discussed, I'm an economist. Does that mean I can tell you what the price of eggs is going to be next month? No, I, I probably can't. Um, what it does mean, and I'll use my wife as an explanation, every time she introduces me to someone, she says, this is my husband, Michael, he's an economist, which means he takes a very, very, very long time to explain the obvious. <laughs> You laugh now, but I haven't gone through this presentation yet. <laughs> Our conversation today will be about the Kansas state budget. Um, Obviously, there are many different facets and avenues that we can go when we talk about our government budget, but something that I most certainly wanted to do was to do my best to uh, try to level the ground and try to make this relatively basic as, as possible. What is it about government that makes it so wasteful? Um, and then in talking about solutions, we'll highlight um, something that Americans for Prosperity, as well as KPI, together worked on, finding a way that we can make government more efficient. And so even though this is talking about state budget, Budget, I do believe that there are aspects of this that you can take to any of your organizations, be it public, private, not-for-profit, what have you. Well, let's start with a bit of a hypothetical. Let's say there's a private organization that's providing you bad customer service. It's upsetting you. It's not doing its job that it's supposed to be. What happens to that private organization? loses customers, and if it loses enough customers, it'll, it'll go out of business, right? What if there's a government organization that upsets its customers, uh, does something badly, upsets the people it's supposed to serve? What happens to that government organization? Yeah, 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 they get promoted. Who said that? Bingo. <laughs> They get promoted, they get more money, somewhere, someone along the lines will say, the only reason this program isn't working is because we haven't given it more money, right? Now, I, I give that example not to say that a private sector solution is always better than a public sector solution. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back on that. There are ideas that can come out of government that it could be just as good as the private sector. That's not where the problem lies. The problem lies is that in the private sector, you have survival of the fittest, right? You have adapt or die. In the public sector, you have expansion of the mistakes. And this brings me to a famous quote by uh, uh, economist Milton Friedman. Everybody know Milton Friedman? Uh, Ronald Reagan, economic advisor, uh, uh, free to choose, uh, great guy. He says this, the problem with government is not in the things that it tries but it's in the absence of having any mechanism for recognizing error. In other words, a private sector can have an idea, implement it, get feedback from customers, and then realize it's not a good idea. Whereas government will have an idea, implement it, and we still pay taxes whether it's a good service or bad. And other than the, po the political interests, there's no way of government really knowing whether it's providing us a quality government service or not. So our conversation today, if you can't read that, don't worry, I'll read it out loud. We're going to talk about the economics of public spending. We'll do a little bit of history. We'll learn from bipartisan fiscal mismanagement. We're going to talk about the burden of government. Um, we'll talk about a solution called performance-based budgeting. And then, of course, we'll end it on some solutions. Uh, economics of public spending. I am um, going to warn you right now, I teach uh, economics at Washburn University and I cannot help implementing a little bit of a lecture, so you're going to have a little bit of a lecture in this presentation today. <laughs> economics of public spending. To uh, have an idea about money and how we spend money, I think it's important to break it up into two different groups. The first group when we think about money is, whose money are we spending? Are we spending our own money or are we spending other people's money? The second group I want you to think of is, who are we spending the money on? Are we spending the money on ourselves, or are we spending the money on other people? 
That type of relationship, those types of interactions can play a pretty good job of telling us what is the cost of that expenditure and what is the quality of that expenditure. As an example, let's do this first box on the upper left. What would you say about the quality and cost of the expenditure when you're spending your money on yourself? Do you care about the cost? Yes. Why? It's your money, right? Uh, it's your money, so you care about the cost. Do you care about the quality of that expenditure if it's you spending money on yourself? You do, why is that? You're spending it on yourself. Now what's interesting though is that now you have to balance that cost and that quality. So if you're spending your money on yourself, you are concerned about both and you're trying to find the best bang for the buck. Now let's go to this one on the top right. What would you say about the quality and cost of the expenditure when you're spending your money on other people? Do you care about the cost of that expenditure? Yes. Yeah, it's your money. <laughs> you don't, you don't want to ship out too much. But do you care about the quality? Now, some will say, yeah, you know, if I'm buying something from my wife, uh, I definitely want to make sure or do my best to make sure I give her a gift as happy as she can be. Um, and sometimes it does work. But let's say when it's not your spouse and you're buying a gift some, for somebody, do you care about that expenditure as much as if you bought a gift for yourself? Probably not. I mean, there's a reason why we buy gift cards for folks, isn't there, right? <laughs> to a certain extent, we say, I, I care, yes, I care, but I don't know exactly what you want. I'm not you, so here's some money. You, you figure it out. You're welcome, happy birthday. Um, so when we're talking about spending our money on other people, we are careful about the cost because it's our money, but we're not as concerned about the quality. Not to say we don't care, I'm just saying we're not as concerned as if we were buying something for ourselves. Let's go to this bottom left here. What would we say about the cost and quality of the expenditure when we're spending other people's money on ourselves? Uh, Jennifer just allowed me to get uh, lunch here at the Pachyderm Club. Um, I could have gotten myself a lobster. I don't even know if they served lobster, but I probably would have found one and put it on my plate. <laughs> do you care about the cost of the expenditure when you're spending other people's money on yourself? No, not really, it's not your money. Yeah, you may care because you, you want to be considerate, but you have to fight that urge. You feel the temptation. Um, do you care about the quality of the expenditure when you're spending other people's money on yourself? Yeah, you want to make sure you're getting a good time. And so when we're spending other people's money on ourselves, we are careful about the quality, but we're not as concerned about its cost. Do you guys see where I'm getting at here? So let's go to this last box. What would you say about the cost and quality of the expenditure when you're spending other people's money on other people? Do you care about the cost? Not your money. Do you care about the quality of the, exp of the expenditure? No, you're not the one experiencing it. When you uh, spend other people's money on other people, you're not concerned about both its cost and quality. Pop quiz, now that you've had the lecture, where does government fall? <laughs> right, so when we're not careful, uh, government can be a wasteful distributor of funds because, I mean, just, this is our education system right there, right, the property taxes we pay are not going towards us, they're going towards kids. And our teacher, not teachers, but our administrators and our, our superintendents and sometimes even our school boards are not being held accountable to the fact that that money isn't really improving the academic performance of our kids. So let's learn from bipartisan fiscal mismanagement, unfortunately. If you can't read this, don't worry, I'll read it out loud. In the Great Recession, we had what I would call the boom and bust cycle. What does that mean? That means that when the recession came uh, and tax revenues plummeted, the legislature did not cut spending along with it. They maintained spending and even increased it. Uh, they didn't use their ending balances to absorb that impact. What did that mean? Well, when spending eventually collapsed, because I think the federal money went away, uh, the uh, state budget was definitely in a pickle, but spending had to collapse, but it collapsed uncontrolled. 
Of course, I want to see starving of the beast. I want to see a more limited government. But I think it really does matter on how you limit that government. You can't just chop off a leg and think that you're doing a good job, right? There are quality government services out there, and you need to be able to find out which ones are good ones and which ones are the ones that you should let go. And you can't do that when you have to immediately take a hatchet to the budget. Governor Sam Brownback, the tax reform era. I would call this the lack of spending discipline. We've seen um, over those four years or so since the 2013 uh, tax package, uh, budget gimmicks, highway transfers, um, uh, little increases of income or little increases in sales taxes to make it work, all because we couldn't get spending under control. And what eventually happened in 2017? We had to raise income taxes. Or well, excuse me, I don't want to say that. Excuse my language. We do not have to raise income taxes. We did raise income taxes. And it was the largest tax increase in state history. And that was only after the second largest tax increase in state history on sales taxes. Laura Kelly, I would call this one the burden of government. We now have the largest state budget in Kansas history, about $9.5 billion. And that's not even counting fees and federal money. If it did, well, you'll see that. You'll see how high that is. But even just the taxes that we pay goes into $9.5 billion of a state budget. Not only that, but Laura Kelly is now implementing the same budget tricks that she had derided Governor Brown back for using. Highway transfers, uh, swishing funds around, uh, slightly tinkering on raising income taxes and sales taxes. Now we unfortunately, you know, according to Laura Kelly, have our cake and eat it too, but we're seeing a large government budget with no reform in, it, in, in sight at all. Have any of you guys heard of the doctor by the name of uh, Max Gammon? This was maybe back during the 70s or something, he was quite, quite, oh goodness, I guess he wasn't profound. Um, okay, there was a British physician by the name of Dr. Max Gammon. His charge was to look at the British socialized uh, medicine, uh, medicine system, the uh, NHS, National Health System. And in uh, observing it, he came up with a theory. He called it the theory of bureaucratic displacement. Long story short, what he basically surmised is that the more overhead an organization becomes, the more bureaucracy it has, the more paper pushing seems to be done by its, by, by its employees. And when I say paper pushing, I don't mean productive work. I mean useless work. We just have to follow this rule because it's the rule, but it has nothing to do with our bottom line or has nothing to do with actually improving the health of the people we're supposed to serve, right? In fact, he described this bureaucratic process like a black hole, where he said the amount of input that we have, we're doing a lot of extra activity, almost like a star flowing into that black hole. But that black hole is bureaucracy, where it absorbs and, and eats everything and continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller without making anything productive. And what does come out of productivity is minuscule compared to the amount of work put in. Does that sound like our education system in a nutshell? Right? The amount of administrators that have grown over the past couple of decades, or let's say counselors that have grown over the past couple of decades, and yet test scores are unfortunately plummeting, or that uh, 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 we are seeing more discipline problems in school, um, and our kids really aren't getting the education that they deserve. If we take it to a broader sense, here's the state, uh, here's the state budget. That $9.5 billion I showed you, that red line is the trend of state, uh, state spending since 1995. That dotted line is state spending if we just kept up with the price level. Now, I know we've been seeing really high prices in the last couple of years, but overall, it's been awfully, awfully muted. In other words, if state spending had just kept up with the economy, it would only be about $5.9 billion. Instead, the bureaucratic machine in our state government has eaten up so many taxpayer dollars, we're now close, approaching $10 billion. And as I said before, that's just state tax revenue. If I included all funds, which means the federal budget, we're approaching, or excuse me, we've exceeded $24 billion. So what do we do? I think we should implement something called performance-based budgeting. Going back to the example that we talked about between the public sector and the private sector, the big difference is, of course, is that the public sector has no idea whether it's providing a good performance, whether it's providing a benefit to the public or not. 
This performance-based budgeting is that continuous improvement process to try to get government to understand whether it's making a mistake or not. It, uh, first step is it assigns a measurable public benefit to each tax dollar spent. Uh, as an example, if there's a, a, a program out there that's supposed to reduce the homeless, homelessness in an area, its public benefit should be assigned, reduce the homeless population in a particular area. The second point, it insists that state agencies assign measures to ensure they meet such public goals. What should programs do in order to, as an example, decrease the homelessness population? Is it finding them jobs? Is it getting them uh, a job referral? Is it uh, uh, building skills so that they can get a job? These particular programs should figure out what goals they can personally reach to meet the overall goal of, let's say, decreasing the homelessness population. And then review that performance to assess where the changes in that public benefit is meeting expectations. All that work you're doing, does it actually affect that goal? If it does, continue doing it. If it doesn't, maybe that's a sign that you need to do something different. And use that performance review to determine the next year's appropriation. If you're hitting your goals, uh, you should, I think you have a strong case of maintaining the same amount of funding you've gotten before, maybe even increase it. But if you're not hitting those goals and you've seen an increase in funds, we should not be giving more money. And finally, that entire process must be open and available to the public. So, uh, performance-based budgeting was passed, actually, as uh, Kansas law in 2016. Uh, but as we know, Governor Brombeck left office in 2017, and Governor Collier barely had time to, to, to get anything done, unfortunately. And Laura Kelly has flat out ignored it. So that process that I just outlined was only just implemented maybe in the past two years. State agencies decided to follow this and they reported their measures to their public goals to the, uh, to the Legislative Research Department and it was a 600 page document. I decided to take a look at that 600 page document and I wrote this. <laughs> Here we have what we call a review of Kansas performance based budgeting. And yes, there are a couple of pages in here, but I think what's really important is I have two pages that basically list all the state agencies that I think were making unsupervised spending uh, in that 600 page report. What does that mean? In other words, I decided to count how many state programs saw an increase in taxpayer funds but were missing their own targets. And that's it, pretty narrow. Um, we decided to call that waste. We decided to call that unsupervised spending. Why should you get more money if you've gotten more money but you still can't hit, hit your target? That means something else needs to happen. And we can't just assume you just need more taxpayer funds. So this table one summarizes everything that was in that report. Are you ready for this? Are you sure? <laughs> Here we go. We found 132 state programs that are spending a record 815 million taxpayer dollars on either failing or non-existent results. Go back to how I counted this. These are state agencies that have seen more funds but are still missing their targets. It's one thing if you could say, well, we're, we're, we're seeing decreasing funds and we're, not, and we're not hitting our targets. No, I didn't count that. I counted those that got what they wanted in terms of uh, your tax dollars, but still can't reach their objectives. 132 state programs, $815 million. 65 state programs didn't report any goals at all. They're supposed to report this in to the legislature, and 65 of them just said, okay, here's something, but we're not really gonna care. We're not gonna actually tell you what our goals are or what we're trying to measure and we're, you're probably not gonna come back at us. Human services, that is the uh, third from the bottom, uh, has the most wasteful spending recorded. Looks like it was 303 uh, million in 2019, and in 2021 it was 348 million. Let's do an example. Here you have uh, KDHE Health, uh, that's the state agency. Their program is the Bureau of Community Health Systems and uh, you have their outcome measures. This is what they wanna be graded on. You have their 2019 performance, their 2021 performance, and then the percent change over that time period. And at the very bottom there, you have their state allocation, their SGF funding over those, uh, two, over those three years. So the first one there says, 
number of acute and a number of acute and a and continuing care critical access hospitals. 2019, they had 85, and 2021, they had 82. It decreased. The second outcome there, number of unduplicated patients served by state-funded primary care clinics. They should want this number to go up. That was 296,000 on 2019, 289 in 2021. It decreased. The third one here, number of instances of individualized technical assistance for local health departments. They would want this number to go up. They don't have any data listed. The last one here, number of cases submitted to trauma registry by hospitals uh, within 60 days of patient discharge. I think they want this number to go down, and I think it has. 14,000 in 2019, 12,300 in 2021. So I think out of those four there, there's only one of them that's doing its job or, or doing what it should do. But look at SGF funding. It grew 19.2% when three out of their four uh, outcome measures were underperforming, have not hit their goals or are not moving in the right direction. So what do we do? Well, we outlined a number of solutions uh, uh, in my report here. The first thing we can do is maybe require the governor to provide a written report on performance savings and where the funds will be allocated. She does this to a certain extent every uh, beginning of the session with her budget report. Maybe included in that budget report should be a review of state agency performance. Or number two, require state agencies to, prevent, to present performance reviews to the appropriate House and Senate budget committees. Um, now, state agencies do, of course, speak to budget committees or subcommittees, but they don't do these performance reports. Maybe they should be required to. It should be a part of that performance. Number three, legislature could deny additional state appropriation if a state program is not improving a public benefit. Seems pretty straightforward. Or number four, create a structural-based budgeting system that can promote efficiency and accountability. Well, that's probably the, 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 the most effective but uh, biggest obstacle change that you could make there. So you could do any one of these four solutions, or you can just ask questions. So as an example, I wrote five questions here that, you, that any legislator can ask of a state agency about their performance review, but it could also be any questions that you could ask in your own professional lives um, to hold any other organization accountable that's asking for funds. Watch, we'll see. First question, uh, did you report your performance metrics? Uh, second question, out of the performance metrics that you reported, how many would you say are moving in the right direction? Uh, has your funding allocation increased in the last so-and-so years of the program? Uh, can you explain how the performance metrics directly improve that bottom line, or is that not the goal? <laughs> and five, if a performance metric is underperforming but you've seen increased funds, why should this, uh, why should this committee appropriate more money? You can use this in any way, shape, or form in any organization, public or private. Do you have, uh, do, what are your activities to reach your goals? Um, have, are you reporting that? Are you being transparent in those measures? Um, uh, uh, bu 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 uh, has your funding gone up? Uh, is any of those uh, metrics moving in the right direction? And then, of course, if they're not moving in the right direction, but we've given you more money, why should we continue to give you more money? What solutions do you have in place to do something different? That should spark a conversation. And so we've been taking these questions to uh, the House Appropriations Committee, the Senate Ways and Means, to legislators um, in subcommittees, you know, making sure that they're prepared to ask these questions when state agencies come asking for more funds. And we've seen success so far. So in summary, without checks, government is an inherently wasteful and expensive distributor. There's always a good quote that says, the burden of government is not measured by how much it taxes you, but by how much it spends. If Kansas lawmakers don't want history to repeat itself, it should find ways to reduce those wasteful spending programs so Kansans can see long-term relief. Because fiscal responsibility is about returning more resources to Kansans without burdening them with more debt, rules, and future taxes. And that way, Kansans can have more freedom and live closer to the American dream. Thank you. Right. We're gonna take questions if you'll stay put. Follow the microphone, Carl's gonna take it around and Pachyderm Club members will get first shot at questions. Just follow Carl. Thank you for coming and joining us today. Let me ask you a quick question 
Um, you teach in what part of or business? Or? Uh, yes, in School of Business Economics. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm a working for graduate. I'm just, just curious about that. Go with Kabbalah. So, um, this outline that you've given, it seems like there's two things that would be helpful. One is, is, is this widely adopted in the American uh, by uh, economists and others that, that are doing these kind of analysts? That, that's number one. And number two, it seems like one of the things that should be uh, in that formula, or the, maybe the question is, can you do better with the same money or can you do more with less? I mean, instead of just always asking, well, we'll give you more if you do well, could, could you do better even with even less money somewhere along the net? Uh, no, I think I'm going to answer your second question first. I think those are fine questions. And the whole point is, you know, I gave you five questions to start a conversation with, right? So they're not going to be five questions you ask, get your answers, and now, oh, okay, I guess I did my duty and, and we're done here. No, they're questions to help spark that conversation and to lead you down hopefully to the goal that you want to get to is do we really have to give you more money or have you figured out what the actual issue is and I think you're you have the same mindset in terms of economists and and, and what they think about this performance measure um, obviously economists are, are, are wide and, and, and varied just like any other folks out there but I think we all understand that um, probably just that biggest issue with the public sector and the private sector being that the government really doesn't have any way of knowing whether it's making a mistake is I think agreed upon by the entire profession, right? And so then there are just many different ways about how can we get government to realize when it's making a mistake, when it mandates that we all pay taxes. Um, that's, that's, that's the question. And so the problem I think we all agree upon, how we get there, uh, you'll probably find more consensus among conservative economists. Mr. Austin, uh, I believe in the decision, if not, uh, when are we going to be in a recession? Are we going to enter a recession? Is that, was that your question? Is there another question? <laughs> um, the second question is, uh, when are the prices of the eggs is going to come down? <laughs> I cannot, I, I cannot predict anything. Um, okay, I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you, a, I'll give you two answers. Okay, there's a reason why God created an economist, and it's to make weather forecasters look good. <laughs> and the second answer is, I can't, I can't tell you when the next recession is going to be, because ultimately you're asking me to predict human nature. Specifically, you're asking me to predict a politician's nature. And while I can tell you that a politician's goal is to get elected and probably to get reelected, I have no idea what it means beyond that. Right? And so um, part of the reason why it's so difficult to, to predict things like this is because ultimately you're trying to predict what gr a group of en masse people are going, to, um, are going to do that's going to cause a recession. And let's be honest, if I knew what they were going to do, then we would probably wouldn't have recessions. So recessions inherently are because of human nature trying to find you know, the, uh, the, the, best pro the best solution to a problem that might actually have an inefficient or a bad outcome. But we would never know that it's coming until it's here. Thank Michael, thanks for being here with us today. You mentioned the base state budget was $9.5 and you mentioned also the all funds was $24 million. Would you explain the difference between those and, uh, and where does that extra money come from? The biggest difference, thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, the biggest difference is uh, fees uh, that will probably go into all funds. So particular state agencies don't get tax revenues. They just issue fees. I believe wildlife and parks is largely uh, function that way. And then there are other state agencies that are largely derived based off of federal funds. So that would be the Department of Commerce, uh, Department of Labor, I believe, through their unemployment system, largely gets funds from the federal government. So that's, those are the biggest differences. Yeah, government had a lot of COVID funds flow into it, and they increased budgets for different agencies. How do you see that being rectified now that COVID funds are going to disappear? 
Um, good question. So we're seeing that to a certain extent now. The, the, the state surplus, I don't know if you've heard the news, Laura Kelly is saying that we have like a roughly $2 billion surplus um, in state revenues, and that's the biggest that we've ever seen. That's the COVID money. Not necessarily COVID money given directly to the states, but the PPP loans that we've gotten, the unemployment insurance help that we've gotten that wasn't stolen by Nigerian princes. Um, uh, that is all the federal dollars that have come into our pockets that we have now either spent or paid in taxes entering state coffers. And it's not unique to Kansas. They're seeing it in Tennessee, Alaska, New York. Every state government is now is flush with cash because of those COVID funds that we've seen on both President Trump and uh, President Joe Biden. Um, so what does that mean? That means you, we have to be very, very careful, of course, on what we spend that money on. Uh, I run, uh, outside of AFP, I run a consulting business and, and working with localities. And one of the things I, I, I preach, of course, is that you have to use one-time money for one-time expenses, right? So uh, don't take that money and let's say give everybody a raise that you now have to maintain. That's going to be a recipe for disaster. That boom and bust cycle that I talked about with the last recession would exactly happen with that organization. Spend it on one-time things that don't have any ongoing presence. Uh, and that includes uh, tax relief as well. If you're going to make a tax relief package out of that, then make it a temporary thing, like maybe a property tax rebate. Um, not only that, but because it's so much money, I would, I would wager, I can't predict anything, but whoever is the next president or whoever takes control of Congress is going to be looking at those federal funds and pushing for audits. And if you've taken that money and you've, let's say, commingled it with things you shouldn't commingle it with, or if you spent it on things you shouldn't be spending it on, you now have a big target on your back. So be open, be transparent, silo that money, and if you're going to spend it, only spend it on temporary and on one-time expenditures. Um, is this Laura Kelly's budget, or is it our chairman of every uh, committee's budget, or the people's budget? Oh, it's always the people's budget, right? Um, it's our money. Right, it's not it's not state money, it's not local money, it's not federal money. Taxpayer dollars come from taxpayers, um, which is all the more reason why we need to ask our legislature that has the power of the strings, right, to hold these state agencies accountable. Because this law was on the books since 2016, um, and yet we've seen, unfortunately, executive agency decide not to follow it unless actually been pushed by the legislature. So it can work, and so I think something relatively benign, like maybe a proviso in the budget, could just simply say, hey, complete with this law otherwise you're gonna take a hack to the budget right make a small ask but with big consequences I think could get something done what government agencies um, are working with you on your report government agencies yeah, no. who's seen your reports fair enough okay uh, no state agency is working with me on my report uh, because this report actively works to most likely decrease the amount of money that they have, so they don't have an incentive to work with me. But we are working, of course, uh, with legislators um, on the House side. We've spoken uh, with, of course, Troy Waymaster, who is the House Appropriations, uh, uh, Representative Cal Hoffman, who is the chair of the general government budget. We have, of course, speaking, spoken to the new freshman class of legislators coming in on both the House and the Senate side. And then, of course, we've always spoken to our natural allies, like Representative Delper, Dang and many others about how we can get this behemoth under control. What's your opinion of uh, public-private partnerships and also like in the state uh, incentives to use taxpayer funds to bring to compete with other states to bring what what some industries you have recently like APAC or the semiconductor or uh, Starbucks. Starbucks batteries, you know, those type of things when to try to get them to Kansas or uh, I'm a little bit this is probably a uh, question I hope. Uh, public money used to bring incentives or state facts to everybody bring incentives to uh, people with Kansas. I don't like it. Um, generally I don't like it. Very rarely will I just say I'm gonna be neutral on it. And I don't know if I ever really have been for it. And the reason why is because when you think about these, um, let's say the big businesses of today, they didn't start out as big businesses. 
We all heard the story about Amazon, right? Amazon didn't start out as a behemoth. It started out in a garage. It started out as a small business. And so um, uh, I, 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 think that, I think that state government and even local, local government feel that there's a temptation to get a photo op or a temptation to swing for the fences to try to get these big businesses coming in, when in reality, uh, economic growth doesn't come from those larger, older businesses. It comes from the small businesses. It comes from the startups. As an example, if Kansas didn't have any startups, let's say startup activity stopped in the 1970s, you know what would also stop? Job growth. We would have the same amount of jobs as we did in the 1970s if we didn't have any startups or small businesses. So then the question then becomes, right, uh, how can we use uh, public funds or taxpayer funds to create an environment for everybody instead of picking winners and losers? And the answer to that is lower the damn rate. Lower the property tax rate, lower the income tax rate. If you're the state, lower the sales tax rate. Create an environment so that any business, no matter who they are, can decide to start up. And so that instead of trying to you know, entice the next Amazon to come to Kansas, you can build it right here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is there any way that we as Kansas can get a copy of this presentation? We can send it to our own individual representatives? Uh, sure thing. Um, not only that, but I will send you a digital copy of our report. I'll send it to either Carl or, or Jennifer, and, and that way we can distribute it to Pachyderm members or anyone else who, who asks. I don't know what your, your rules are. Um, but yes, we can do that. Thank you. I was curious about uh, outside influences affecting the budget. Uh, I remember back when uh, uh, Mr. Brownback uh, had the issue with the uh, education, it seemed like there were these outside influences that took one number and then blossomed it into something far larger. And uh, I, was a, I was just curious how much of a difference that makes these teachers' unions, as a prime example. Uh, Okay, yeah, sure. Um, you know, on education and under Governor Sam Brownback, I think it's important to get the truth out. Governor Sam Brownback never cut the education budget. In fact, that was part of the problem. I, he was getting accused of, of cutting the budget, and I would even say, you know what, I kind of wish we did cut it, because at least, at least we could own it. Um, you know, or at least we'd get the budget under control, and we could take that argument away from them. But they were hitting us from both sides. They were accusing us of cutting it, um, and they were using that, of course, to, to raise taxes again, which doesn't make any sense if you take a moment to think about it. So in terms of those outside influences, they're, they're always there. So the school lobby is always there. Um, you know, the, 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 the woke social services groups and organizations are always there. And, you know, it's up to folks like us uh, to not only show them the facts and the data and the logic, but also just make a really, a really strong emotional argument as to why our way is the morally superior way, right? You know why we need to have a government that acts just like a family budget where it stays within its means, but how can we show examples of government, you know, wasting your funds and creating horrific results? One of which I think is just a really good example is the school system. You know, we come back to that. Let them defend the status quo and say, why should we defend so many kids not being college ready? Or why should we defend the fact that so many low-income kids are just being pushed out the door to graduate, but they have to take remedial training if they do anything else outside of the public school system. Um, I think pushing back on these types of outside influences can say a lot. We've seen that a lot with the with the school choice issue, right? Um, they're, we're making them defend the fact that public schools, by and large, are doing a, a, a really bad job. Um, and now we're using that as an opportunity to put some change into the system and give parents the, the power and the resources they deserve. Thank you. Ronald Reagan said that the problem with government is if it moves, they tax it. If it keeps moving, they regulate it. If it quits moving, they subsidize it. <laughs> but my, my question to you is the, the federal government is within a few years of the interest on the debt being the third largest line item after Medicare uh, and Social Security. How is Kansas budget exposed? One year treasury's gone from year zero to year five percent. How is the Kansas budget exposed to a rising interest rate environment? Uh, thank you very much. Well, when we're thinking about the federal government 
budget. We have, and we have asked our representatives and senators up in D.C. to cut our taxes, but don't touch spending. I mean, let's be honest. This is what we have asked. Yes, there are some of us that have asked for federal government to be smaller, but that's uh, a very small minority. We have largely said, keep spending going, but don't raise my taxes. And so naturally, D.C. Has, has, has obliged. And what has that led to? It has led to inflation, the stealth tax, right, where your purchasing power has gone down, effectively like a tax increase on your wallet. Um, where you can now buy fewer and fewer goods and services. And the same thing is now being exposed on our, our state budget as well. When we ask our state legislators to you know, maintain government services, just blanket, right? And we don't give them a tool about how they can do that efficiently. And then we say, but don't raise my taxes. We're also asking for the exact same thing. So in terms of exposure, uh, interest rates is, is definitely one way that it can come down, but it can also come down through inflation as well. And so I really think it's important that whenever we do this tax reform, we need to find a way to pay for it. Um, and I don't necessarily think it should be on the revenue side. Some people might disagree. That is OK. I think it can be done on the spending side. And that's why I've written this report. You don't have to use all $815 million to finance a tax revenue cut, but you'll find some money in there that you could use. Use. There would be a program or two that you'll realize really is not needed um, or really is just paper pushing and extra work that you could use to provide some relief back to you all. Michael, thanks for being here. Thanks, Deb. Um, how do our schools, which is our largest spending, are they following performance-based budgeting? Oh, that's a good question. And the answer is I did not include them in this report. I think they were excluded from the performance-based budgeting. Universities are in here, but not the K through 12 uh, education system. Now, I don't know about the politics of that. I have a pretty good idea of how that came to be. Um, but as we all know, if, if Dave Chaubert from KPI was here, you know, he could have a whole presentation about all the different types of efficiencies, depending on how you want to define it, that's happening in our school system. Whether it's the amount of cash they're just sitting on and not spending, whether it's the reallocation away from the classroom to more counselors and more administrative bloat, or whether it's the fact that just outcomes are just moving in the wrong direction uh, when you compare it to the national average. I, I don't have enough time to tell you all the different uh, efficiencies and, and, and waste that we're having in the school system, but we all know it's there and we should hold folks accountable for it. Yeah, according to our capers, how are we doing according to the 50 states? Oh, good question. And unfortunately, I wasn't prepared for that one. So I'm going to have to speak in a bit of generalities on that. We are most certainly improving on it, I believe. Oh, wait. We have, no, do you want me to call on you? No? Okay, I'm not calling on you. Okay. Um, I, uh, we are most certainly improving. I know we had one of the worst, um, uh, worst stressed uh, retirement systems uh, in the country, uh, but thanks to our, our, our chair at the time for House Pensions, who is now our state treasurer, Stephen Johnson, um, he has most certainly worked to improve that. I believe we are still around average um, so there are definitely more ways that we can improve, one of which is, of course, stop assuming such a high rate of return. Maybe we should you know, adjust that down a little bit more towards reality. And then I know I've heard from folks about CAPERS 3 most certainly needs some work. Um, and I think that's an appropriate discussion for the legislature to have about how we can improve that particular subset of the retirement system. I've got a two-part question for you. I uh, really appreciate all the details you've had here in this model you've put together. Is any other state following the budget model that you've outlined here? Second, second question I'd like to have you explore in detail, the difference between the general fund budget of about nine billion, the all funds budget of about 24 billion. <coughs> I know the highway program is off budget and then and then all funds and federal Medicaid spending, mm. which has been a big budget buster, is in are, are not part of the general fund to make a part of that difference. Can you go into a little bit more of the detail in terms of how much of that uh, between Medicaid and the, high, and the highway program? Because many other states put their highway program in their general fund, and Kansas doesn't for some reason. And that's been a perpetual football being kicked around up in Topeka. If any insights you could share on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carl. So in terms of whether other states have implemented this process, um, to be honest, I 
do not know off the top of my head. When I put this report together, what I was looking at in terms of uh, areas to mimic or copy was actually the state of, not state, the country of New Zealand. Um, New Zealand back in the 90s and early 2000s had a, a real economic boon and part of that boon was uh, uh, their legislators as well as their, their prime minister really took an effort to implement this type of performance-based budgeting throughout the whole nation. Um, funny story, so uh, I can't remember the prime minister, uh, but when the prime minister took office, she had, of course, not she, he had cabinet heads and uh, he had the cabinet heads in the room and he said in one year, I want you to take all of your agency spending and rank it. What is the most, what's the highest priority? What's the lowest priority? You have one year to do it. If you can't do it in a year, I'm gonna fire your second in command. Yeah. After that first year, uh, had another meeting with those cabinet heads and said, now that you've ranked them, um, I want you to assign a public benefit for each one that you have ranked. Why is it important? Why does it, how does it help you know, everyday New Zealands, right? You have one year to do it. If you can't do that, I wanna f I'm gonna fire your second in command, right? So these small asks with large consequences, right? Uh, really motivated uh, state agencies to kind of get their stuff together. And, um, and what's nice about that is that if you rank your priorities, then let's say you have a recession, you already know what you need to get rid of. You already know what's important and what you, know, you can do without. You work from the bottom and you, and you work your way up depending on the severity of that recession, which is not what uh, other nations or the state has done. And then to your other question about the highway fund and Medicaid, you're exactly right. If I could group those things together, it's really about maintenance of effort, right? Or matching funds. You know, so the highway fund is a mix of both federal funds as well as our sales tax uh, that goes into it. And part of that is because the federal government has said, if you give us 100,000 or if you spend 100,000, we'll match that. Or maybe even we'll double that. And that has largely led to the big imbalance between uh, the state budget and of course the all funds budget. And it's most certainly true even when you look at Medicaid. I don't know the actual numbers off the top of my head, but I know that is functionally why the divergence is there and has gotten bigger over the years. Thank you for speaking here at the Packerderm Club. I have a question about subsidized housing. I think that both the state and the city government and county government gets involved in that budget. Um, do you have any words of wisdom for making that system work? We have a growing number of homeless people in Wichita. I understand now they're going to build some more small housing, but yet we have uh, housing in South Wichita that uh, I understand is about 80% vacant and you know all torn up and, and just a waste of taxpayer money. So do you have any anything uh, to advise the uh, office holders about how we can effectively or more effectively use that money? And then at the end, just for fun, give us your best and worst about Adam Smith and your best and worst about uh, Milton Friedman. Okay. All right. And when it comes to housing, um, I would say there's a, there's a quote from uh, Thomas Sowell, the, the economist, and he says um, something on the lines of, I'm going to misquote it, is that one of the things you'll always hear from critics is, how would you make the system better? Right? And he goes on to say, if I put out a house fire, I don't want to hear what I'm going to replace the house fire with. When we're talking about subsidized housing, that in part is the issue. Right? Because what you're doing is you are mandating prices below what the market would set it at. And it creates, unfortunately, lower quality housing. It creates, uh, it creates all uh, uh, builders to work to lobby the government instead of building more homes. If you want to build more homes, find a way to make it cheaper to build, uh, build more homes. Decreasing regulations make the cost, you know, find ways that we can get government out of housing. Uh, find ways that we can encourage more people to come into the area. And that way you have both supply and demand forces, which will be stronger than any government program in order to create more housing. We have a housing crisis because it is expensive to build homes. That's the focus. Find ways to make it cheaper and more affordable than to just mandate certain amount of homes be built at a certain price level. Because then you'll get bad quality and bad results and you'll never fix the issue. As for um, my uh, favorite and uh, worst things about Adam Smith, I don't know. I, I, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't around when he was around. Um, so it's not like I can um, speak to, to experience here. Um, 
you know, one of the, uh, well, and I think it's probably in general, is, is the thing about economists is that we have ways that we speak to the general public and then we have ways that we speak to each other. Um, and the way that we speak to each other, some most economists out there think that everybody else can understand them. So the worst thing I would say is that even with Adam Smith, um, is it's 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 a working it's a work in progress of how we can find ways to communicate the the fundamentals of what we learned about economics so that everyday people can understand. Because clearly we're in our situation because more people need to know economics and need to follow it. But the best thing, of course, is that economics, um, and I tell this to my students, is, is, is a way that you can understand so many different other, other subjects um, without necessarily having to learn it. And that's because economics is the study of human nature, right? So yeah, math has certain rules, but whether it's psychology, public finance, uh, uh, education, you understand you know, how people behave under scarce resources, and it gives you the tools to try to almost work with any type of problem that, that people are dealing with today because of that background. So I, I would say that's the best thing I've learned from the two. Very good. Michael, can you walk us through, well, the chamber introduced uh, the flat tax legislation. Can you walk us through your thoughts on that and where that stands? Sure thing. So uh, you're right. The Kansas chamber did introduce a, a, a single tax rate, a flat tax option. And um, I actually, this kind of even goes back to Milton Friedman again. Uh, one of the policies Milton Friedman most certainly advocated for on the federal level was a single tax rate with a large standard deduction. So uh, obviously a, a single tax rate makes a lot of sense. You know, if it's 5%, you just take 5% of your income and, and boom, that's your tax rate. Pretty easy to understand and calculate it by yourself. Um, but then if you want to think about for those low income, you want it to have an increased standard deduction so that if you are low income, you don't even have to worry about, you know, paying taxes, period. Um, that was his ideal. And I think the Ch Kansas Chamber had, uh, had that exactly in mind when they proposed, I believe it was House Bill 2061, which did exactly that. It implemented, I believe, a 5% tax rate and it, it increased the standard deduction for individual filers to $15,000. In other words, if you make a minimum wage, you don't have to pay state income taxes. If you make above minimum wage, you just got a pay raise, right? Um, so that is what they introduced in the House. It has died a bit in the House, and it has been taken back, uh, uh, picked back up in some way, shape, or form in the Senate. In the Senate, it's a little bit different. In the Senate, they have a 4.75% uh, single tax rate, but they, they, they barely touch the standard deduction. So um, I think it most certainly needs a little bit more work. I want to see an increased standard deduction because I don't want to see our most vulnerable Kansans taxed. Um, uh, uh, but I think if we can get those things in, ooh, and one more thing, Whenever our revenues are beating expectations, instead of that easily funneling into the budget, it should funnel back to the tax rate, right? So if those revenues beat those expectations, lower the tax rate with it. And I think other states have done that, and I think it's time we follow suit. Good. Thank you, Michael. Lawson. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend.